With tensions rising and the increasing likelihood that Russia is getting ready to invade Ukraine, the U.S. and other NATO allies are getting ready to step in. The U.S. is shipping hundreds of millions of dollars of weapons and readying to send more than 8,000 troops to the region to respond to the threat. And Joe Biden says he's also considering direct sanctions on Russian President Vladimir Putin himself, a step the U.S. has long avoided. While Putin has repeatedly denied he's preparing to invade, blaming the U.S. and its allies for escalating the conflict, and Ukraine's president is maintaining he's working toward a peaceful settlement, White House officials say they believe invasion is imminent, although the president did admit yesterday that Putin can be unpredictable. I'll be completely honest with you. It's a little bit like reading tea leaves. But as for what's at stake, Biden spoke with a lot more certainty. There will be enormous consequences if he were to go in and invade, not only in terms of economic consequences and political consequences, but it will be enormous consequences worldwide. This would be the largest, if he were to move in with all those forces, it would be the largest invasion since World War II. It would change the world. Joining me is Congressman Seth Moulton. He's an Iraq War veteran, a member of the House Armed Services Committee, who spent time in Ukraine last month. Congressman, it's good to see you. Good to see you too, Jim. Will there be a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine? There may very well be. And my fear is that we haven't been very well prepared for that option. That was the conclusion I reached when I went there in December. Uh, I sent my findings directly to the White House and also wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal saying, look, we might think that he's only going to do a limited incursion, but we need to plan for the worst. And the White House is now doing that. What you hear Biden talking about is preparation for that kind of invasion. But I think it's, it's a bit late. Well, you also uh, wrote in that piece, I believe it was that piece, that the stakes are in some ways even higher than Joe Biden is talking about. You believe that if Russia is successful in Ukraine, Ukraine is just the first stop on the Russian journey, correct? Well, in many ways, Ukraine is already the third or fourth stop. I mean, look what he's done uh, in Georgia. I mean, look what, he done, what he's done in southern Ukraine, the Crimea, already. He's clearly learned the lesson that aggression works. And if he relearns that lesson, lesson with Ukraine, but on a much wider scale by conducting something on the order of a full-scale invasion, then yes, I think we all have to ask, what's next? I, I don't see any reason why after success in Ukraine, Putin would just say, okay, that's enough, let's stop. You say that Joe Biden hasn't done all the things you think he should uh, have done, at least not in timely fashion, like what? Well, there's, there's three main things that we need to do. Uh, number one, speed weapons pr procurement. Uh, they are sending weapons, defensive weapons, to the Ukrainians right now to increase the cost of a Russian invasion, but it's taken too long. And members of the House Armed Services Committee, myself included, have been calling on them to do this for months, in some ways for years, uh, but, but certainly in the last few months. And it seems that that weapons procurement is only speeding up now that it's a little bit late because they have to know how to use these weapons. Second, we've got to what make else? clear exactly what these economic sanctions are going to be and, and how they're going to hurt Putin personally. Just yesterday, President Biden came out and said that he is considering personal sanctions against Putin. I've been calling for that for over a month. And third, the real, the real weakness here in Putin's calculus is, in fact, his domestic support. And there were a lot of organized Russian mothers who protested the fact that uh, Russian boys were coming back in body bags after the last invasion uh, of Crimea. And so we need to communicate this directly to the Russian people. He can't just have a negotiation with Putin and expect him to convey the cost to his people. Russia has no problem speaking directly to the American people through the internet, trying to influence our elections. We should have no hesitation telling the Russian people the truth about what an invasion could cost. Well, you, you say that one of the problems he faces, Putin faces, is lack of unity at home. It seems to me that one of the problems we face is lack of unity uh, among our allies. Germany seems well, very hesitant to get involved in this effort, and some other uh, NATO allies seem to be more concerned about the gas that flows from Russia to their country than they do about joining with the United States to stop this invasion. 
Look, I, I think those uh, those points are overplayed. And frankly, Putin himself is trying to uh, make any slight disagreement in the NATO alliance uh, into turn it into a huge division. I had an hour-long meeting with the German ambassador just last week. And it was very clear to me from that meeting that Germany is completely uh, on board with us, completely on our side. But there are details to work out. You know, if we put tough banking sanctions on Russia, uh, German banks tend to over comply. Uh, they tend to go above and beyond the call of duty when it comes to compliance. We saw this as a result of the Iran nuclear deal. And so they want to make sure they have exceptions for German banks so that we don't hurt the German economy in unexpected ways just because we're trying to target Russia. These kinds of concerns are legitimate. The Germans don't want to uh, have no gas for the winter. We are finally moving to reassure them that we will provide all alternative gas supplies. But again, that's just happened in the last week. It should have happened a couple months ago, in my in my opinion. So look, the, but to the put NATO this alliance- in, If I may, put, I'm sorry, go ahead. But to put no, this look, in context, said, Congressman- it, 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 Yeah, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, Jim, sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, it seems to me that uh, I understand your criticism of the, the slow pace of some of the behavior by the Biden administration, but to put it in some context, we lived through four years of Putin's poodle being the president of the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, uh, Joe Biden is doing the right things, it appears, according to you, just not on the timetable you'd like to see them done on. Is that is that a correct that, statement? That that's absolutely right, Jim, and and and, and that should not that point should not be lost on anyone. That uh, this is a very dire situation, in my estimation. I think uh, we've known that for some time, and that's why I've been pushing the administration to do more and to act more quickly. But this is a complete sea change from having a president in the Oval Office who was a lapdog to Vladimir Putin, who trusted Putin. He told the world this. He trusted Putin more than the American intelligence agencies. So we've come a long way from Donald Trump, uh, but this isn't just about playing politics with who's better about Russia. This is about responding to a national security crisis. And that's why I'm not afraid to criticize uh, the White House if, if we need to be doing better, regardless of whether it's a Republican or a Democrat in the Oval Office. You know, speaking of national security, in this case ours, we've heard a lot, we the American people heard, have heard a lot of what we intend to do directed at Russia, but it seems to me not nearly enough about what Russia intends to do to retaliate in our direction. I read that he's just had conversations with leaders of Venezuela and Cuba. Is there the danger of a Cuban Missile Crisis 2.0? We all remember the colonial pipeline, if not from Putin himself, but from Russian operatives. Cyber attacks and putting weapons near our country uh, sort of tit for tat thing are real threats, are they not? They're very real threats. And I think just quickly, uh, there's a historical lesson that Russia may have learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is that, you know, as brilliantly as Kennedy handled that crisis, at the end of the day, the deal to undo it was, in fact, to take uh, American missiles out of Europe. That's exactly the kind of thing that Putin wants here. And then on the cyber front, uh, look, one of the things I've been working on for the past five or six years in Congress is modernizing our national security. I co-chaired the Future of Defense Task Force, which is all about for shifting from the big old heavy technology of the past to the nimble hybrid technologies of the future. This is the kind of war that Russia is prepared to wage. It's not just about tanks rolling across Europe. It's about cyber attacks, undermining election, actions in space. These are the kinds of investments that we have been slow to make to modernize our national defense. And these are exactly the kinds of things that Putin is looking to take advantage of. So there's a lot still that could occur. But you know, staying one second, Congressman, on the, the, the uh, cyber threat, uh, it seems to me, as someone who's not an expert in this area, but read a little bit, is that our critical infrastructure is at risk, and what stands between us and that is sort of a 21st century version of mutual assured destruction, that they know what we can do to their infrastructure so they won't do it to, to ours. Is that not a realistic assessment? 
It is. And, and we lost a lot of ground over the past four years. You know, one of the points that I would make whenever Trump brought up his silly border wall was that what we really need to build is a cyber wall around the United States to, to protect ourselves, to defend our critical infrastructure, our critical inf industries, uh, even universities that are just doing basic scientific research that the Russians and the Chinese are trying to steal. We have to have better cyber defenses for our entire nation. And while Trump was worried about putting up a wall, uh, you know, on the border with Mexico, he wasn't investing in the kind of cybersecurity uh, that we need. And that's another reason why we're more vulnerable today uh, to these kinds of Russian, atta Russian attacks. It seems to me one very piece of, uh, piece of good news, though, on this preparation front is unlike Trump, who will obviously criticize every move Biden makes. Yesterday, Mitch McConnell, the other leader of the Republicans in America, America had this to say about what Joe Biden is doing. I read that the president was huddled at Camp David uh, Sunday with his team. And what I've been hearing since then is encouraging that um, they're prepared to take steps before an incursion, not afterwards. That's a pretty good sign, is it not, Congressman? Well, it is, it is a good sign. I mean, coming in the same week that Mitch McConnell uh, apparently stated that black Americans are not actually Americans, uh, I guess it's a good sign that he's saying something right. Uh, Mitch McConnell has a long way to go before he puts the interests of the United States ahead of his own political interests. Um, but look, I think that he respects what uh, Joe Biden is doing, and uh, and he clearly recognizes this is sea, this is a sea change from the approach that Donald Trump took to Russia. You know, I'll probably go to hell for defending Mitch McConnell in one thing, but also this week he said that when Republicans are running in midterm elections, they should not run on the big lie that the election was stolen in 2020, which again seems to me to be, maybe it's a body double, but it seems to me to be good news. Congressman, can we shift for a second from international affairs to domestic politics for a remaining minute or two? I'm sure everybody sure. watching knows that in 2016 and 2018, you were quite vocal uh, saying that it was time for new younger leadership to replace Nancy Pelosi and her uh, team. And what seemed to resolve that dispute, for lack of a better expression, is she agreed to step down at the, as speaker or leader of the Democrats at the end of this term. Here she is yesterday talking about her uh, at least running for Congress again. Here's uh, Congresswoman Pelosi. Our democracy is at risk. But as we say, we don't agonize, we organize. And that is why I am running for re-election to Congress and respectfully seek your support. And nowhere in that statement is, I'm sure you know, Congressman, that she say anything about running for speaker or leader of the Democrats, should they not have a majority. But her spokesperson was asked by the Washington Post, and he said this, I have no idea what it means, but he said, the speaker is not on a shift, she's on a mission, whatever that means. Let's assume she does violate her commitment to you and your fellow members and does run to lead the Democrats again. Are you content with that? No, I mean, look, her, her agreement was about running for speaker, not about running for re-election. It's obviously entirely up to her whether no, no, she no. wants to uh, for re-election. Right, I understand. If, if she, she runs does, for speaker or leader... Yeah, go ahead. Look, you, you, you want to have leaders you can trust. And uh, we made that agreement uh, in trust, and we would expect her to, to live up to it. And if she does not live up to it, will you support an alternative candidate? I, I certainly would if there's a better candidate running. I'm always going to vote for the best candidate. And I hope that you will see uh, other people stepping up to run for, for speaker and the other positions in leadership, because I do think that we need new leadership in the Democratic Party. And as we as we look to you know a troubling midterm season, uh, one of the things I think that can give Democrats across the country a lot of hope is some real clear plans for the future, that this is not uh, a, a party that um, is sort of having its last gap in the House. Uh, there are a lot of people who expect our demise, but rather we're a party that's really building for a strong future. And that's how we that's how we show America that we should hold the House in 2022 and pick up even more seats going forward. Congressman, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for your time. Jim, good to see you too.